Okay. Who's going to be my communicator to just do that? If I can hear him. Okay. <laughs> it's early in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> First thing. To the public, just stand That's there. the camera. Okay. Okay. <laughs> here we go. Okay, here we go. Three. Hey, welcome to the Wild and Scenic Film Festival. This has been 15 years that we've been celebrating this festival actually the largest environmental film festival in the United States, which is pretty amazing considering we're based here in little downtown Nevada City in Grass Valley. I'm Elisa Parker. I'm the host of the WSFF Media Lounge. I'm so excited because we have Jan here with us, and she is the creator of the film Drogba. And if you've ever had these visions or dreams of going to Tibet and seeing the landscape and just learning about the culture and, uh, and some other heavy issues too actually that are going on that we need to know about. Drogba is an incredible film and Jan, thanks so much for being here at Wild and Scenic. Thank you so much for having me. It's Liza. great to have you here. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> so um, is this your first time at the festival? It's my first time at the festival and first, first time in Nevada City. For, and so how's it been so far? It's awesome. It's gorgeous here. Yeah. And where did you travel from? Uh, I came from uh, Boulder, Colorado today, uh, yesterday. Yesterday, okay. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the film Drogba. Um, so Drogba uh, is a uh, Tibetan for nomads. So the film is about Tibetan nomads. And uh, it's a very much a, a immersion film that you get to see how the nomads live their life. And everything is in the backdrop of uh, this uh, very serious global environmental uh, I would call it a crisis that um, the the grasslands are degrading uh, into desert in a rapid rate on uh, the eastern Tibetan plateau that will affect like nearly half of the population on the planet. Um, but um, it's you know you have this kind of a heavy background, but then you have you know people still living their life and you know have families and you know of course different family issues. Um, and it's just, uh, I want to bring people uh, like emotionally close to those people and just not feel like that's something really far away, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you did an incredible job too of connecting the, the personal stories with that. And you know, one of the things that made me think of too, there were a couple of things that came up in this film. Uh, one is around the families that you featured mm -hmm. and the women, so we're going to talk about that. <laughs> okay. And then the second part was just like you said in the environmental shifts mm -hmm. and change and how mm -hmm. that's impacting especially uh, the nomadic lifestyle, the mm -hmm. people that survive there, they, like the yak. Mm -hmm. The yak is really like a huge part. It's of a their huge life. part, yeah. And then um, their culture is actually depending on it. So everything they, you know, from their from their houses, from uh, the fields, uh, and their transportation before, it was on. It was depending on the yak, and then of course yak eat the grass, and then they eat all the grasslands. <laughs> yak eat the grass. I know. Well, so what was really interesting too, and you'll see this when you watch the film, is that you know the yaks have this land and space. To her, you were there what over three years? I was there for over three years. Um, I started in 2011 uh, and get to know the community, uh, and I started filming in 2012 and from 2012 to 14. So within that amount of time, in that three years, just the yaks alone have all this space. And then at the end of that three-year period when you're shooting, they have less space, right? Mm -hmm. People have been giving less amount of land, and mm -hmm. now the yaks are confined, mm -hmm. and a lot of the yaks were getting sick, mm -hmm. and they were producing half the amount of milk, which mm -hmm. they use as butter and other forms. So it was so fascinating to me just to see the significant impact mm -hmm. just on having that shift, mm -hmm. a shift just like that, like confined space. For example, what were some of your biggest takeaways in creating this film? 
Um, like before I went over there, I was probably in the same school with many environmentalists that would think um, like cattle are not good for the land and you know, of course the, the animals are eating the, the grass away and that's why desertification happened on the plateau. But after I stayed so much time with the people and then I realized that you know, yaks and animals, they're very much an integral part of the environment, the ecosystem. And it's a coexisting environment. The grassland needs the yak, the yak needs the grassland, um, which is something I didn't kind of consider before. And also just uh, how much knowledge people have in terms of making use of the land to use it the most effective way possible. And still, I mean, the culture's been there for Thousands, thousands of years. Thousands of years. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of knowledge in there. And um, how did you connect with the family? And can you tell us a little bit about the families that you featured in the film? Um, so I stayed uh, for the most part with um, this family. And um, that's the teenager. Her name is Tamku. Uh, he's a teenager and he's a mom <laughs> as well. Um, his stepfather um, speaks some Mandarin. And um, when I first visited the village, he was chosen by the village chief to be my translator. And then I get to stay with their family. For so you the were living time. in their, um, tell everyone about their living styles and what that looks like. <laughs> um, so they, they're nomads, so they definitely move around uh, places. Um, so I would take um, transportation to, um, they call their, their winter camp. Uh, some family will have a, a wooden structure and some family will have a, 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 a yurt, I mean, a, a, a tent. <laughs> and um, I think at the end of the film, you saw um, the government build brick houses for them in order to try to settle them into a quote yeah. unquote village. And that's the same place with their, their winter village. And then from their winter village, they will travel uh, either on um, uh, like sometimes by foot, sometimes by tractor, uh, going to um, like another location for either the spring or the summer. So they have about two or three places that they will move around uh, throughout the year. And those places already being allocated to them by the government, which actually contributing to some part of the um, degradation as well, because before they were able to move uh, according to what's best for the environment. Now they're fixed into locations. Which is totally yeah. like shifted, yeah. just their way of living. And what was it like to live with the family oh, over yeah. that three year period? I mean, that's pretty incredible. <laughs> and it's almost like a giant camping trip with like 11 families with elders and little babies. And um, so I would stay um, with some family. I stayed in the same tent with them. Um, you know, everyone would just, you know, during the day, you clean out the tent and yeah. at night and you put uh, your beddings down and and that's where you sleep and there are some family i will have a separate little tent with tamku um because i got so friendly with her so i get to stay in the tiny little like a teepee looking tent with her and have you ever done yeah. anything like that before uh yes <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> camping or just like being though like in a living in a yurt in the this really isolated area uh yes um before uh actually uh, at the beginning of this project i was looking for a location where um i was i had this image in my mind that i want to film a community where it's like really close to some background of changes that's very visible and um, my first location was actually in the Gobi Desert in Mongolia. Wow. And I stayed some time with the camel herders in Mongolia. And wow. So. All right. I could talk to you for hours <laughs> about all that's fascinating. What's been like the, what's, you know, we're at Wild and Scenic. What's been the wildest thing that's happened to you, we're both in, in creating this film and with, and with even living with camel herders? Um, I, everything is pretty everything is pretty well. wild yeah yeah um i remember the very first time i went into the community um i had a tibetan driver at the end of the day he's like oh i have another place i want to take you to and that was eventually the place when i first got into their like a community room it was a whole room full of just male <laughs> tibetan smoking and it is like i was like oh do i really want to go in there and talk to them and but they were really friendly and they said come back in two days and 
um, would take you to see places. Cool. Yeah. And well, <laughs> and, well, and speaking of the men too, what I was fascinated, the other part that I thought was really fascinating about this film is that what I realized is the women were doing most of the work. Can you mm -hmm. speak to that a little bit? And I don't think that was the intention of your film when you set out no, to create this. No, that was not the intention at all. And um, of course, after you stay there for a few days, then you observe that's what happened. Um, and uh, so pretty much everything around the yurt is done uh, by women. And they actually set up their tent in a way that you will go in the tent. Uh, and then this side, they call the women's side, which has all the, you know, the, the butter making machine, the, you know, everything about work. Um, the women's side and the men's side, they used to have the prayer set. Now they put TV sets there. So, um, and <laughs> but in, in retrospect, um, like men before, they have to herd their animals all sure. day long. So they have a lot of time spent outside, but since they're confined, and so they don't have that much time or, or, or that much need to be out there. Sure, so, yeah. interesting. Yeah. I know there's a scene where she's carrying what, how many gallons of water? On I her would back? say 10, yeah. 10 gallons of water on her back. <laughs> yeah. And then she gets in and she's in the tent and she's sitting there like this, just watching the guys playing their game. And you know, it was there was one scene too where um, they're, they're, the women are folding up the tent. Mm -hmm. It's a really meticulous process mm -hmm. and it's really big and heavy. And then there's the, the guy that is putting his TV in the case. <laughs> yeah. And he's putting his TV in the case with such care and just like trying to make sure it's all set. I'm like, wow, that's, was that, uh, when you did that shot, was mm -hmm. that like on purpose to show like the distinction between the, and how the culture's influenced really the westernized culture? Um, I didn't really think too much when I filmed it. It just looked so interesting it to is. me. Like, I just, it just dropped my attention. I'm so like, I look how it. much he loves his TV. <laughs> and the women are here folding the tent. Um, and so we talked about this last night, but mm -hmm. in being at the edge, which is our theme for mm -hmm. tonight, what, um, what's one of the things, or when you've had to step out on the edge, literally, and take that leap of faith, what was one of those situations where you had to be, literally be on the edge and go for it? Um, I think I mentioned a little bit, just starting of this project was pretty much a leap. I mean, it, even just, I think the start of this whole project, it's a leap, you know, talking about five years of kind of, I mean, it's suffering, but it's also like great joy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you going to go back there? Uh, yes, I have pretty good, uh, you know, close relationship with uh, the family. So yeah, every time I go back to China, I will either call them or make a trip down there. Yeah. And what do you want to say to everyone about what they can do to make a difference, especially around uh, as it relates to your film mm -hmm. and relates to the nomads in Tibet, especially given that so much is becoming desert right now? Um, so part of what I want to make this film is actually looking for organization that might be able to do some of the restoration work there or even just to bring this awareness of uh, changes on the Tibetan plateau. Like there's so much talk about um, uh, ice melting and you know island uh, getting flooded, um, but not so much about what's happening up there. And it's a very big thing. I mean, they call uh, the plateau the third pole. And so even just bringing out the awareness of the situation is very much appreciated. And where can people go to get more information about the film? And so there's a website for the film. It's called drakpafilm.com. Yeah, Great. there's information there. Thanks yeah. so much, Jan. Drakpa is the film. I'm Elisa Parker. We're here at the Wild and Scenic Film Festival. We are going to be streaming live for the next two days. And have a great time. When is the film screening? Thank you. Um, the film is screening. I'm actually heading over there on, at uh, Grass Valley at 10 o'clock. And there's another screening in Nevada City at 4 p.m. this afternoon. And I do have a few copies of the DVD, and I'll be selling it after the showing uh, and then before the showing this cool. afternoon. So. Thanks, Jan. All right. Um, I'm Elisa. Go check out the film. It's really incredible. I certainly learned so much about it. All right. Thanks. Hey. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jan. That was awesome. That was great. I know I could sit and talk to you for a long time about this because.